Those of you visiting, I don't see any visitors. My name is Matt. Welcome to North Star. I'll be filling in for Joshua, who is in Texas. Did not check the weather, but I'm sure it's much hotter than that. Um, as you know, most of the last year, we've been talking in First Peter, talking through, um, you know, just a lot of things about shepherding, a lot of things about uh, how we are to live as Christians. Uh, great time. We're taking a couple weeks, a few weeks break in between, and then we'll dive into, dive into uh, Second Peter here. Um, so a couple things we're looking at today, well, next week also will be a psalm. Today we're looking at Psalms 23. Very providentially, I did not know that was going to be the reading. So either very, very high levels of coordination or very, very low levels of coordination there. Um, let's read this together, please. Psalm 23, I'll give you a minute to get there. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this time you've gathered us here to hear your word preached, to worship together, to sing your praises, to walk humbly under your great shepherding, Lord God. Pray right now for, um, for my heart, for my posture as I preach, that I will be diligent to your text, that I will faithfully speak the words of scripture and that you have laid on my heart through your spirit. Pray right now for everyone hearing this, everyone here sitting here today, even those who might hear it later, their hearts will be opened and softened to hear what you would have for them, Lord God. Bless this time as we study your word. Hear me pray. Amen. So this is a very well-known psalm. In fact, we read it twice today. I'm sure many living rooms are adorned with a pillow or a wood plaque that says, The Lord is my shepherd. It's often used as a starting point for a conversation with someone who's having a tough time. It's a psalm that we know well. It's full of comfort. But this psalm is also full of deep theological truths. Truths that remind us of our helplessness, our reliance on our creator, and his promise to meet all of our needs, to bring us comfort, to protect us, to be the source of all the blessing in our lives, even salvation, as we will see. So today, as usual, will be expository. We're going to go through this entire psalm, but there are going to be four main points here. You'll see them on your notes. You know, we're going to look at the chief shepherd, how God is our sovereign shepherd, how he protects his flock, and then lastly, our posture in the face of evil. So let's start at the top. The Lord is my shepherd. There's kind of two subpoints under this main phrase, the Lord is my shepherd. One, the Lord, God, is our ultimate shepherd. And then the second one is we follow our shepherds and our pastors as they follow Christ. So we spent a lot of time this summer on the topic of shepherding. For those of you who've been with us, we've rewritten our constitution even to accommodate the potential of other elders. And we talked about how God has called men to be shepherds of his flock. And Joshua preached about how even young men, teenagers, but all men realistically should live our lives to aspire and desire the office of elder. God has also called us, the flock, to submit ourselves to our shepherds. Submit ourselves to the loving guidance and counsel of our pastors because they will give an account for our souls. They're there for our benefit as individual sheep, but also as a flock. But all of this points to the good shepherd. All of that, all of the New Testament, it points to God as our ultimate shepherd. The Lord has given us under shepherds, shepherds, pastors, but they are under shepherds of the chief shepherd. Our great senior pastor is Christ, and he will never leave us or forsake us. So we can benefit greatly from 
the wisdom and the care and the love that our pastors give us, but they are ultimately under shepherds of the Lord, who is our ultimate shepherd. That should be very comforting. What a great, great thought that is. No man is our ultimate shepherd. That, that would be a cult. Scripture is full of examples, Old and New Testament, of God appointing spiritual leaders over his people to care for his people, to lead them in the way of repentance and righteousness. Go back to thinking of Israel. We see it clearly in the New Testament. God calls and the church ordains godly men to be overseers, to be our shepherds, to devote, to devote themselves to prayer and ministry, specifically the ministry of the word, but they are under shepherds of our great shepherd. They are divinely appointed, but they are not divine. They are flawed men. They're human. By the grace of God, they are still being sanctified. But in their sanctification, they are able to be gracious and loving and caring and used by God. But we know that pastors, shepherds are human, are flawed. And I know many in this room have experienced poor shepherding. Have experienced... uh, I don't know, let's leave it at poor shepherding, right? We've seen the major major scandals that you'll see, right? We've heard about them at some point or the other, maybe the famous ones, maybe the local ones. But it's also just poor shepherding in general. Like a church that's too focused on programs or ministries, revenue, where you never even meet your pastor. Or a pastor who's focused on brand building, writing blogs and getting YouTube likes. Or maybe just a pastor who's just spread too thin, who desires to shepherd well and just can't through life circumstances. Pastors who wear themselves out over years of ministry and it just becomes a drudgery. Pastors are not perfect. But hear me now, having a bad experience with a pastor or a church or a brother or sister in Christ is no excuse to turn your back on the people of God and the fellowship. Or his commandment to submit yourselves to the authority of your elders. Because you, we, belong to a higher authority. We belong to the Lord. The Lord is our shepherd. Men will fail you. All men will fail you. I hate to break that to you. David, former shepherd boy, anointed by God to be the great king of Israel. Defeated Goliath, brave warrior, all that good stuff. The author of this psalm before us today, many psalms. He failed. He failed pretty mad at mightily. And yet, Scripture calls David a man after God's own heart. Not because he was perfect, but because he followed the Lord with all of his heart. All of us this side of glory are imperfect, yet the Lord is our shepherd. No pastor we will ever have will ever be as good of a shepherd as Christ. So pastors are called and appointed by God, and we are called to follow them, to submit to their counsel, to be accountable to them. Likewise, they are called to follow Christ and to lead, and to lead well. We're blessed to have Pastor Joshua in our lives. I love Pastor Joshua. I know he's going to listen to this. I cleared this with him because it's true. We look up to Pastor Joshua, but we do not look to him for our salvation. The author of Hebrews says in chapter 13, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And then the very next verse he says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So yes, look up to your pastors. Seek to follow their examples they're called. Yet Jesus is the unfailing, unchanging shepherd. The Apostle Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So scripture is clear. We are to submit to the authority of scripture and the leadership of our pastors. We are to stay steadfastly devoted to following the Lord. And they are supposed to stay steadfastly devoted to following the Lord. Win-win scenario for us. Paul reminds us we are all in submission to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Galatians 1, he says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. So, Pastors are to lead well and to say, follow me as I follow Christ. Yet, if we say something contrary to what you already heard from us, we are cursed. Here's the charge given to pastors by Peter. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, shepherd of the flock 
of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And then the very next verse says, so be subject to your elders. So what's the call? The call for those of us who have heeded scripture, even those who have been moved to consider, to potentially consider the office of pastor or eldership, this is how you're to act. Exercise gentle oversight. Don't do it for your own personal gain. Do it selflessly. Do it eagerly and gently. Do it out of love. Be an example to your flock. Even in any circumstance you are or setting you find yourself in, be gentle, be loving, serve eagerly. And we, the flock, are to follow our shepherds well, our pastors well. We ultimately put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. He restores my soul. This brings us to the second of our main points today. God is our sovereign shepherd. The Lord leads me. The Lord restores me. Who does this? Does it say, the Lord gives me a map to green pastures? Say, the Lord gives me green pastures and still waters and hopes that my soul is restored? Afraid not. It says, the Lord makes me, the Lord leads me, the Lord restores me. I want you to think for a second about the theological implications of that statement. The Lord is leading. The Lord is making me rest in him. The Lord is restoring my soul. And in the next verse, he leads me in the path of righteousness. God does not suggest we lie down in green pastures. God does not hope that our soul is restored. David, in the inspired, inerrant word of God, is acknowledging the majestic and gracious power of our Lord. I do not want to turn this sermon into something it's not. I don't want to belabor the theological points in this sentence as it relates to conversion, election, perseverance of the saints. But I also want to be faithful to the text and not ignore what Scripture has for us. The words of David and the Holy Spirit on this matter. The Lord is our shepherd. The Lord is an all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful, loving shepherd. Think about a human shepherd. We don't really have a lot of shepherds among us today. I know we have pig farmers. I know we have some people with goats, but we don't see sheep on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but we do have a sheep-like substitute, teenagers. Teenagers can be helpful in helping us see clearly how this works. Thank you for sitting in this front row, teenagers. Um, I say this lovingly. I really want to say this cautiously. Hear me with the purest of hearts. Teenagers are idiots. Thank you. Thank you for giving me that amen. I don't just say this now as I own two teenagers. I say this, I've said this since my kids were this big. I'd be like, what are teenagers? Idiots! What are you going to be when you're a teenager? An idiot. This is factually accurate. If you are in that sweet spot right now, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, hear me. You are as smart as you're going to be for the next 10 years of your life. You have got this figured out. You know when to rely on mom and dad. You know when to ask for help. But you can do chores. You can make yourself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You can help out. You don't try to solve your own problems. Hey, mom, dad, help me do this. But you're pretty self-reliant. Teenagers, not so much. Teenagers, they know everything. There's a lot of amens going on here. You can't teach a teenager anything, really. You can't reason with them. You can't spank them. All you can do is watch them wander around, get in trouble, and rescue them time and time again. Teenagers and sheep, sorry, sheep, I should say, will naively go into harm's way. So when you were a kid and your mom's like, would Billy jumped off a cliff, would you? A sheep would go, yeah, yeah, I would, right? Sheep have the same mentality, the same wherewithal as unfortunately teenagers do. They do not know how to tend themselves. They do not know how to make good decisions. And how many times scripturally are we referred to as sheep? So like, do you think, 
Jesus and the prophets and David lived in a time when shepherding was extremely common. And everyone walked among sheep and knew someone who was a shepherd and got their clothes from sheep. Do you think they were ignorant to the intellectual prowess of sheep? Like, when Jesus tells Peter, Peter, feed my lambs, Peter doesn't go, you know, Jesus, actually, maybe we can call them donkeys, because a donkey will, you know, he'll stop working when he's overburdened, but a horse, he'll just fall down dead, but donkeys have a self-awareness. No. Jesus, fully God, post-resurrected glory, tells him, no, they will stray, they will get lost, they will be afraid, they will go against their own best interest. So what does a shepherd have to do for his sheep? Everything. When a wolf comes, does a shepherd say, okay, guys, listen up. Wolf's coming. You three in the back, you run like you're scared. You guys up front, why don't you fake a leg injury, and the rest of us, will ambush this wolf. No, that doesn't happen, because sheep don't have the wherewithal for any of that. Sheep scatter and run in circles. Their lives depend on the goodness of the shepherd. That's it. Think about it from the sheep's perspective. The sheep, wandering around, hmm, I'm kind of hungry. Oh, there's some sweet grass right here. I love this. Mm, this grass is making me thirsty. Oh, look, there's a cool pool of water right now to drink from. It's easy from the sheep's perspective to feel complete autonomy. But it's the shepherd that ultimately brings food and water and rest and protection to the sheep. The sheep reap the benefits of being loved by the shepherd, whether or not they recognize how much the shepherd does for them. That is a beautiful truth. That does not diminish our personal responsibility towards faith and obedience and even righteousness, but it gives us great comfort in knowing we are not in charge of anything. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still water. He restores my soul. And he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He leads me in the path of righteousness, in salvation, in fellowship with him, in forgiveness of sins, for his name's sake, because it glorifies him. For our good, for our eternal benefit, but for his glory. Your salvation does not depend on how well you understand stand scriptures. If you were raised in a Christian home, how good you are to make a good decision based on what you think is the right decision. Oh, you know, I make, you know. You're a sheep. God has done the work of salvation and preserving your faith because he is the good shepherd. 1 Timothy 1. God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. That is not too ambiguous. God saved us and called us before the ages began. Acts 17. This is Jesus saying, speaking, the God who made the world and everything in it, I'm sorry, this is not Jesus speaking in Acts. The God who made the world and everything in it does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by humans' hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all mankind life and breath and everything. Think about that statement. The God who made everything does not need anything from you. He's not served by your hands because he gave mankind life and breath and everything. Tell me again what you bring to this God. You want to really bake your noodle? Does God need your love? God is love. God gave us his love. Our love for God is from God. 1 John chapter 4, God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. We love because he first loved us. Even our ability to love God comes from God. What about our salvation? Paul writes in Philippians, speaking of our salvation, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Who began the good work? Who's going to bring it to completion? common argument I hear against the sovereignty of God, especially as it relates to salvation, is that it means God has created robots. He needs to create robots to love him. I got a lot of scripture that does not show me that. This shows me a loving God, 
a shepherd who cares for his sheep. A loving shepherd who does not let any who have been given to him fall away. So David and the prophets and the New Testament authors, they're unified in their belief that God is the good shepherd. He calls his sheep, he leads them in the way of salvation, and he is faithful to keep us in his saving grace for his name's sake. And he keeps us because we need him to keep us because this world is harsh. Continuing on, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. This is our third point for my note takers. It's likely David wrote this passage in his old age, um, according to the scholars, latter stages of his reign. This is written by a man who has put his hands, his life in the Lord's hands countless times. He has seen how good of a shepherd the Lord really is. Recount the highlights of David's life. One of our first things we know about David, he was a young man, a teenager. The army of Israel is camped out against the Philistines, and they're being taunted to fight the giant Goliath. David's too young to even join the army, so he volunteers to go fight Goliath, and we know the story. And Saul scoffs at him and says, you're too small and weak. And I'm sure Saul was right, to be honest, right? But David says to him, when I used to tend sheep, I killed lions and bears. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. So now think about this entire psalm. David, a former shepherd who rescued his sheep from these ferocious predators. David, who in this psalm calls the Lord his shepherd, says he will fear no evil because the good shepherd is watching over him. How can a man who lived such a hard life, David's life was filled with bloodshed and battles and life or death situations. He lost his newborn child after fasting day and night. His own son tried to overthrow him, take his throne. A man who was not even spared the weight of his own sin. How can he find so much peace in trusting the Lord? David did not live an easy life, and we are not promised an easy life. That is for sure. You will walk in the valley of the shadow of death. You will deal with struggles and hardship. You might be sitting here dealing with them right now. Maybe you have a hard marriage filled with bickering, maybe on the edge of divorce. Maybe you're a parent. Maybe you have teenagers. Maybe you want to be a parent desperately. Maybe you're in poor health. Maybe you constantly suffer physically or emotionally. How can you trust that your suffering is for God's will and his glory and his name's sake? Inflation, politics, the FBI coming after you for posting a meme. We could literally worry all day long. There are evil and hard things in this world, but fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. If you are sitting here today, if you are in Christ, you have a good shepherd. Trust that shepherd. King David faced more severe woes than you and I can imagine. And he fell on his knees more and more and put his life and faith and trust in the Lord. Don't fear evil. Don't fear job loss. Don't fear for your health. Don't fear for your ability to earn an income or provide for your family or for coming calamity. I read the news too. Those are important things though. Work diligently. Be a good steward. Be a good husband. But in all you do, trust the Lord. Fear no evil because the Lord is with you. David continues, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Staff, shepherd's walking stick, picture little Bo Peep. Don't picture me with a bonnet. A stick with a little hook on the end. That's for hooking the sheep that go astray. It's for clearing brush, for clearing other hindrances. That staff, that shepherd's staff, brings comfort to the sheep. But the rod, the rod also brings comfort to the sheep. Parents, What's our favorite verse? That's right. Spare the rod, spoil the child. It's a bit of a paraphrase, right? The rod is for correction. Lord knows the teenagers among us need it. But it's also for our protection. When David is convincing Saul to let him fight Goliath, he's speaking of fighting lions and bears. He says, I went after him and I struck him. And if he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and I struck and I killed him. David is using his rod for protection of the sheep. That rod can keep a threat at distance. That rod can poke, can hurt. 
That rod can beat a lion or a bear to death. That rod can be used gently to offer correction to us, sometimes not so gently, but that rod is there to offer protection to us. Our good shepherd is not looking to beat his sheep, but to protect them from harm. Outside harm as well as self-inflicted harm, but that is for our comfort. We have a shepherd. He guides us lovingly with his staff. He does everything he can do to clear our way, to make our paths straight, to lead us in the path of righteousness, to lead us beside still waters, to grab us gently when we go astray. But we have a shepherd who fights for us. We have a shepherd who fights for us. Jesus says in John 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Jesus is our shepherd by his own words. That's his promise to us. We are his. We belong to him. Jesus says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will lay down my life for you because you are mine. That's what, that's what our shepherd says to us. Take comfort in that. I wish we had time at some point to dissect all of Romans 8. It is worthy of several weeks of study. Paul's writing, Paul the Apostle's writing, he says, There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, those in whom the Spirit of God dwells. We've been adopted into his family as heirs of God, as fellow heirs with Christ even. And Paul tells us the Spirit of God intercedes with groanings too deep for words. That is powerful intercession that the Spirit of God makes in our behalf. And then in verse 31 he says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Think about that, brother and sister. If God is for us, who could be against us? I was reading actually in 2 Samuel 10 this morning, I think, and David and his brother and the Ammonites are arrayed against the Syrians. They're all going to attack Israel. And he's like, okay, you go fight the Ammonites. And if they overwhelm you, then I'll fight, come help you, and I'll fight the Syrians. And if they overwhelm you, come help me. Like, okay, we got a two-fronted battle. You guys are conspiring to wipe us out. And he literally says, I didn't write it down, but it was, and we'll, let it, we'll see what the Lord just deems is right. Like, okay, like I'm willing to go fight and die, and we'll see how it works out, but that's the, will of the God, that's the will of the Lord. Take comfort in that. If God is for us, who can be against us? Fear no evil. We will walk in the face of danger and turmoil and trials. Very real trials. I'm not diminishing them. Death, disease, loss, temptation, work, family, kid issues, marriage issues. I get that. But God is for you. His loving staff will set your path straight. His staff will grab you gently if you're going a little left or right. His rod will beat back the forces that line up against you. You are not for a moment forgotten or ignored by God. His rod may correct you. It might poke you. It might give you a whack on the backside. But this loving direction and correction are for your good, provided by a great shepherd who is doing all of this for your salvation, for your sanctification, for your righteousness, to keep you from the very gates of hell. This brings us to our final main point here, our posture in the face of evil. Our posture in the face of evil. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Personally, I don't know about you, I prefer this said something along the lives of, I will wipe out your enemies and prepare a table for you before your friends. Every year for my birthday, I love, love, love. I have a tradition. We go out to eat with some of my closest friends and family. I've been doing this for 20 plus years. Before I moved up here, we had a place in California called Lucille's and two months in advance, my wife would send out the text message, and we'd get the place reserved, and we'd have a bunch of people coming out. I'm talking people I've known 15, 20, 30 years, my family. We'd go to Lucille's, and I'd order onion straws. We'd have biscuits and apple butter. And every single year, without fail, I'd order a giant rack of baby back ribs. This was my comfort zone. I didn't need to be sung to. I didn't need presents. I just wanted to be surrounded by my friends, those who knew me and loved me best, those who I trusted with everything. I want sticky fingers with barbecue sauce, surrounded by my friends. This is my security blanket. Try to imagine, try to imagine that birthday celebration surrounded by enemies. 
your worst playground enemy bully, or your worst boss or coworker that you've ever had, a friendship that ended poorly. And what will he do in the presence of our enemies? You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the presence of my enemies, he will prepare a table before me. He will anoint my head with oil. He will bless me so much that I cannot contain his abundance. And goodness and mercy will follow me all the rest of my life. In the face of evil, in the face of danger, in the face of our enemies, God will bless us like never before. Amen? Hold, your, hold it. It's not name it or claim it message time right now. This is God's blessing. This is not our blessing. David survived multiple assassination attempts. David knew battle and fear and bloodshed. David had to go to another country and hide out and pretend to be insane so that he wouldn't be killed by King Saul. David had his wives and his children kidnapped. David knew starvation. David knew the loss of life, like I said, his newborn child. David knew the betrayal of his closest advisors and his own son trying to usurp his crown. David the psalmist is not saying you will not know trouble. David is saying no trouble can harm you if your hope is not in this world. Yes, you will be blessed beyond belief. But maybe not financially. Goodness and mercy will follow you all of your days. And those days may be short. And they may be filled with suffering. My favorite Jim Elliott quote He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. Everything physically good on this earth we cannot keep. Our eternal hope we cannot lose. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Philippians, Paul's writing to the Philippians. He's from jail. He's been imprisoned for sharing the gospel. He says this, What has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Well, that's a good attitude. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, and that with full of courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Well, that took an odd turn. For to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul says, I know this is good. I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Oh, yeah, I might die. Paul's at peace with the fact that either option is for the glory of God. Our circumstances are not our blessing. Paul's not, I'm sorry, David is not saying, as long as you promise to be good, as long as you live a good life, you will end up rich and victorious, and your enemies will tremble before you. David is saying, when you walk with God, you will never tremble before anyone else ever again. Paul is in prison. He doesn't complain about the food or his treatment. He's overjoyed with the fact that he's been able to share the gospel with the entire imperial guard. That's his hope. Paul's table is literally set in the presence of his enemies, and his cup is overflowing. He literally says, I don't need to be free. I'm already delivered. If I die, Christ wins. If I live, Christ wins. When you live with this true, abundant hope, you will fear no evil. You will sit in the presence of your enemies, yet your cup will overflow. You will be more content than you can possibly imagine. Our blessing is this. We have a good shepherd who loves us dearly and tenderly, who wants good things for us. Yes, sometimes he wants material comfort for us and financial stability. Sometimes he wants that for us as a time of rest and rejuvenation. But, but sometimes he wants that to be times of trouble. Sometimes that's for correction or reproof. Sometimes it's so that we can be tested and refined. Sometimes it's so we can be a light to this fallen world like Paul in the jail. Our joy is not in our happiness or our circumstances. You've seen little kids, I'm not going to say this is my kids, but you've seen little kids playing a board game. And when they're winning, yes, best Monopoly player ever. 
And when they're losing, flipping the board games around, getting upset, throwing a tantrum. We are far too often those little children. We receive what we sheep perceive as good. If we don't get what we think is good, we can become angry and bitter. Our forefather Job said it best, shall we only receive good from God and not evil? We are sheep. We don't know what's best for us. We wouldn't know how to get it even if we did. Your joy depends on you having the life you want, whatever that looks like. Happy marriage, to be married, be blessed with children, good job, not suffering physically, not suffering emotionally, having 10-acre homestead, having pigs. Your job, I'm sorry, if your joy depends on your earthly happiness, I'd struggle, I'd suggest you'd struggle to ever find your cup overflowing. Let your joy come from dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. Question one of the Westminster Catechism, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. None of these things we listed about what you want in life, good things, worthy things, can satisfy our need for him. They are not our chief end. It's not why we were created. We will walk in the valley of the shadow of death. We will sit among our enemies. We will face times of trial and tribulations, and in those times, we will be blessed. In those times, we will grow closer to God. We will learn to love and trust one another, even this body. We will trust in our shepherd. We will fear no evil because God will protect us, and he will guide us, and he will lead us, even in the path of righteousness. And it's only when we put our full trust in that heavenly shepherd we will know true joy. And this is not because you will never face trials or hardships, tribulation. You read the news, you know we're facing trials and hardships and tribulations. But we can joyfully point our faces to heaven and trust in the good shepherd, the Lord, because he is the one who makes us lie down in green pastures. He is the one who leads us beside still waters. He restores our soul. He comforts us. And surely goodness and mercy will follow us all of our days. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God, our good shepherd, we are in awe of all you do for us. Eternally grateful. We have been paid a debt we cannot repay. We love because you loved us, God. Thank you for the blessings of your word and your faithfulness to us. Go with us as we continue out this day worshiping you and into this week. In your name we pray.